3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Happy New Year to you. I think it's still safe to say that. And we're still in the Christmas season, so Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, as he is every single Thursday, Father Brian Malady, how are you? Okay. Now, I said it's still the Christmas season, but it's winding down, and tomorrow we've got a big feast, huh? Yes, the traditional epiphany, or Twelfth Night. Um, As you know, after Vatican II, they moved the celebration, if a person, the bishop wanted it to be moved, to the Sunday after, I assume, so that more people could come to the Mass, um, because it would be the same as Sunday, whereas... Before, unless it was a special holiday in your country, which in much of all Europe it would have been. Um, but, I mean, in uh, missionary countries, many people wouldn't be able to celebrate the Epiphany or wouldn't do it. So the Epiphany comes from a word which means manifestation in Greek. And interestingly enough, it involves three different celebrations and three different manifestations of Christ. You have the obvious one connected to the nativity itself, which is the one of the kings or the magi coming to Bethlehem to adore and worship the child. Now, there never was any statement made in scripture about how many of those people were, but it's been traditionally considered to be three and the reason is because there were three gifts brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And each of those has a meaning for Christ's future life. Of course, myrrh represents the uh, burial of Christ. It was a burial ointment and aromatic. And so it represents his death. And frankincense, the fact that he's God. And then gold has to do with his dignity as a king. Uh, these magi are very mysterious figures. I was doing some research on them, and some people think that they were not Persians. They certainly weren't um, astronomers or people like that. And some people have used the translation astrologers for them. They certainly weren't that either. But they were possibly related to the Jews, possibly Edomites, possibly some refugees from the destruction of the temple, and they were Nabataeans. And our most uh, uh, greatest familiarity with the Nabataeans comes from the movie Indiana Jones. And because it uh, takes place at one of them, the Last Crusade has him in this very strange and interesting temple that's still a tourist attraction today, in this valley, well, that's where they lived. And they were also on the principal caravan route from the east to Jerusalem. So they came to adore the child. And remember, the way it's presented in Holy Scripture is that they were led by the star, so they were reason, they represent reason. They were led by the natural law or reason to Bethlehem to uh, Jerusalem because salvation comes from the Jews. When they asked where the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures said that the king of Israel had to be born, then they had called together the scholars of the law. And you remember they said, well, Micah says Bethlehem. So they received that as their response. And then when they adored the child, they did him adore him as God, but as also in some sense a redeemer and a savior. And interestingly, in the Matthew's gospel, it says that they went back through another route 
One scholar I know speculated that that route was through Antioch and that they were highly influenced by the church that would eventually become the Pauline dimension of the church by the wisdom literature in Antioch. In addition to the Magi, of course, you have the manifestation of Christ himself when he begins his public ministry at the Jordan. Now today, there are some people who would maintain that Christ didn't know he was God until that moment, which to me seems ridiculous. It's obvious that he, he's the person of the word, made flesh, he certainly, as the Word, knows, even in his human nature, from the time he was uh, conceived, that he is the second person of the Trinity. And also, the manifestation is given, remember John connects it with the Lamb of God, and then you have this wonderful event in which the cloud appears over him, which is the Word, and you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Father, and the Father speaks, and Christ himself is in the Jordan being baptized at that time. Now, he doesn't need to be baptized himself, but he submits to the baptism of John to approve a rite of the Old Testament, and also when the waters touch him, they receive their ability in our sacrament of baptism once he dies on the cross, to, once they touch themselves to us, transform us within to be like him by grace being conferred. And if that wasn't enough, then you have this very homey example in which it's a family affair and Mary's involved in it, and that is his manifestation in Canaan. And all these things are recalled in the Feast of the Epiphany, where he turns water into wine at the instance, insistence of his mother. Uh, as she intercedes for the couple, he saves of him embarrassment, and he does this by this action, which is miraculous. And so all three of these things are come together in our celebration of the Epiphany, because if Jesus had just come out of the womb of his mother. Who he was and why he was here wouldn't have been clear. But in these three manifestations, connected to baptism, connected to reason being realized in faith, and finally connected to marriage, the saving of the face of people, the insistence of his mother, all come together to show he is indeed the word made flesh. So yes, our Christmas celebrations do continue and some people even would carry them through till February 2nd, which is the Feast of the Presentation of our Lord in the Temple. It used to be the Purification of Mary also. And we bless all the candles because Christ is the light of the world. Where do you come down on when Christmas ends? Oh, well, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, as far as the... Theology is concerned, it would end when the Lord of the temple comes to meet the temple and finally fulfills the rites of the temple. So you're a February 2nd guy. we ourselves meet him February 2nd. But as far as its celebration is concerned, I think Epiphany is certainly sufficient. The baptism of the Lord? Not, not, yeah, in, yeah, not in running for you? Well, no, in, that, in the sense that it's all contained in the Feast of the Epiphany. But it is certainly a part of the mystery, and so is the wedding feast of Cana. I'm just happy for anybody who doesn't have their Christmas tree out at the curb by 5 o'clock Christmas Day. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's a bit much. Straight, yeah. yeah. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Andrew in Midland, Michigan, and we've got plenty of time and open phone lines for you. If you'd like to be part of the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. And it just occurred to me, I didn't give the phone numbers at the beginning of the program. 833-288-3986. Um, four empty lines for you and plenty of time for your calls. If you're outside of the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at one 
205-271-2985. And you can always send us an email. That email address is openline at ewtn.com. That's openline, all one word, at ewtn.com. It's EWTN's Open Line Thursday with our Thursday host, Dominican father, Brian Mullady. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. This is Prudence Robertson. Now more than ever, Americans need to know the facts about the science, the law, the politics, and the fight to end abortion in America. Through the lens of our Catholic faith, we can make a difference in this battle to protect the unborn. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, Sunday morning, 10 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. This is Janet Morena of Priests for Life with Pro-Life Update. This year's March for Life in Washington will be the first one after the reversal of Roe v. Wade. It will be a time to celebrate and to renew our commitment to defend the unborn. It will also be a time to honor the dead. On Sunday, January 22nd, we will gather in front of the U.S. Supreme Court to remember the 65 and a half million children killed in the womb by abortion since Roe v. Wade. This time of prayer, sponsored by Priests for Life and several other groups, starts at 11 a.m. The pro-life movement will never forget these children, each one of whom is a person with human dignity. We entrust all of them into the hands of God, and we ask forgiveness as a nation for failing to protect them. See the full schedule at priestforlife.org slash March for Life. This is Janet Morana on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call one 205 Two seven one two nine eight five, or send us an email to openline at ewtn.com. You know, we do well by ourselves to learn from the example provided to us by the saints, and I've got a great item here at EWTN's Religious Catalog. It's a St. John Newman DVD. This EWTN original docudrama filmed on location in the Czech Republic and the United States explores the life of St. John Newman from his early life in the Czech Republic, his ministry as a redemptorist priest, and his appointment as the fourth bishop of Philadelphia in 1852. St. John Newman was a zealous missionary and founder of Catholic education in the United States. This is a one-disc DVD, one hour long, with closed captioning. And it's available now at EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. Free standard shipping on online orders of $75 or more. That's standard shipping in the continental United States only. Use the code FREE at checkout. Still three open lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. First up today is Andrew in Midland, Michigan. Listening on Ave Maria Radio. Andrew, you're on with Father Milady. Hi, Father. How are you doing? Hey. So, uh, I've heard several times that Satan is not able to hear our thoughts. And I suppose the reason is, uh, the argument is that only God can hear our thoughts or something like that. And I was wondering if that's true. And if that's true, like when we pray to Mary and the the saints and the angels, do we have to do we have to pray aloud because they can't hear our thoughts? Uh, well, as to the first, I I think I would deny the major premise. Uh, Satan certainly can hear our thoughts. It's one of the reasons why diabolical possession is so difficult, because he knows your life. <laughs> and the hidden things in your life that other people don't remember. He is an angel. Um, I, I don't think you, Mary, I believe Mary and all the saints can also hear your thoughts, and you don't have to pray aloud because of it. So that's what, uh, what I would say. Would it be a situation, the things that the Lord would make known to them? or 
Uh, no, I think because, at least with Satan's case, if you're dealing with the saints, you're dealing with human beings. Um, but in, in Satan's case, because it is an angel, he certainly knows our hidden thoughts. Um, I, I, I don't have any question about that, I don't think. All right, very good. Andrew, thank you so much for the phone call. Merry Christmas to you. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. Linda writes in, Father Brian, my father passed away about four years ago. He had no family on his side, just my mother and myself. I understand the church teaching that cremation is okay, but ashes must be interred. However, I didn't know or understand fully this teaching back then. My father was cremated and his ashes scattered. I didn't personally do the scattering. Everything was taken care of by the funeral home. I've been living with the guilt since. Did I commit a grave sin? Am I a horrible person? I just can't shake the guilt I feel that I did a terrible wrong and don't know how to make it right. Can you help? Well, I can't make a judgment on whether you're a horrible person or not, but you certainly did commit a sin there of disrespecting the ashes. Now, like all sins, you just ask for forgiveness and confession. It's very simple, really. And I wouldn't waste any more time about it than that. I mentioned it in confession. And uh, part of it was due to invincible ignorance on your part because you didn't know at the time and presumably hadn't investigated much and didn't really know what the church discipline was on that. But the idea is that whatever you knew or didn't know or whether you're bad or good, the reason we don't scatter the ashes is because it's considered disrespectful to a holy thing, which is your body, which participated in the actions of your soul. After all the sacraments, all those things occur on your body or in your body, and your own conversion of heart and all that, that's all connected to having a body. But uh, I wouldn't, I, I, the, the other questions you asked me are asked in such a way that I can't really give you an answer one way or the other because there are lots of distinctions. I can tell you what the objective fact is, that that in fact is contrary to the dignity we owe the body. As to what your guilt is, that's another issue. And it would take a while of discussion to be able to figure out what that is. As for thinking you're a horrible person, well, you may not be. There are a lot of things that are done by that are evil by people who aren't horrible people, but they just don't know. So once they find out, well, they need to confess if, if they had any responsibility for it at all um, and for the uh, ignorance which they uh, had. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Grab one of these open phone lines at 833 833- Two eight eight three nine eight six. Mary is a first-time caller in the great state of Oklahoma, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Mary, you are on with Father Brian Milady. Hi, Father Brian Milady. Um, I just want to say I've read a couple of your books that really helped me out, Grace Explained and um, The Decalogue. Oh, good. Uh, the one about the Decalogue. And, and I had to read them a couple of times, and I, I, I I'm, will read them more even because they just blessed my life. I, um, I have a question. Um, I live near a family that um, is trying to evangelize me, knowing that I'm Catholic, and treating me as if I'm not saved. And, you know, the, the ch- I've done a little research on the, the church that, you know, they attend, and I know some of the background and and stuff, and, um, you know, it's not favorable in how they, you know, what they believe about the Catholic Church. But, so I just continue to pray and be kind, and, uh, but they they send their child to do it. (laughs) They send their child to try to evangelize me, give me track about how to be saved. You know, it's never the adult. (laughs) And I'm talking, you know, 10 years old or so, you know. So anyway, so this, so one day they even sent her up to me in the freezing rain. You know, I'm, you know, getting out. Of, but anyway, so I, 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 I said, may I ask you a question? I said, when were you baptized? 
And she said, the little girl said, oh, I, I'm not baptized yet. And I said, well, that's interesting because I am. And uh, and she didn't know how to respond, so she went back over to, you know, and to the parents and things. And so, I like I said, I, I think some good things are happening because I'm following what the church teaches on how to deal with situations like this, to respond in love and patience, you know, because that's how God responds to us, you know, in our uh, circumstances in life. True. But so, so what I'm wondering is, so, so I ponder on these things. I think about these things um, because I'm like, what, you know? And so in some of these Protestant um, denominations, they withhold baptism from their, their children yes. until they, okay. So my question is, is, uh, from what I know about the definition of atheism and agnostic, or agnostic and agnostic, is an agnostic is somebody who hasn't for sure said God doesn't exist, but they're just kind of in that limbo, or they're saying they're undecided about it. Mm-hmm. So isn't that placing their children into that type of, you know, into being an agnostic, even though they're attending a, a you know, they claim to be Christian, and but is is that not a, you know? putting them into that realm of being an agnostic and allowing that and from, you know, in, a, in their years of formation? Well, uh, no, I don't think so, uh, because that's the parents' belief about how you practice Christianity. Um, there were a number of the Protestant reformers. Uh, and Luther himself had difficulty with this, but he was a, such a logically contradictory figure, he could live with logical contradictions. But basically, the Protestant protest is against sacramentalism, not so much the papacy or those other things, but it's the idea that a physical ritual can communicate grace to you. And so if they don't think it can, the only reason they would embrace baptism as a ritual or even infant baptism is out of respect for tradition in the church but they don't necessarily believe it does anything for you. In fact, Lutheran Confirmation is supposedly where you accept your baptism. When that's, and that's when they're like 18 years old. There are some people in our church today who'd like to make our understanding of Confirmation the same, but it's not. I mean, we continue to accept our baptism from the time we become aware. And that would traditionally be seven they're on regarding our own salvation. So it's, it isn't that they're agnostics, they're not, but they just have a different attitude, a different belief in the sacraments, which is very much connected to their belief in Christ's physical body and all the physical nature of the church. So what you just need to do is what you're doing, really, is to just do your studies, you know, read your books, Uh, practice Catholicism lovingly and uh, just uh, if it comes up not if it it doesn't come up but if it comes up and they they ask you something you do have an obligation to respond with the truth Thanks so much Mary we appreciate the phone call and we will keep you in our prayers The number to be yeah the number to be on the program is 833-288 EWTN that's 833-288-3986 if you're outside the United States and Canada we'd still love to hear from you that number is 1205 271-2985, and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Kevin in Kansas City, Lorraine in Melbourne, Florida, Pepino in San Antonio, Texas, and we've got plenty of time for your phone calls at 833-288-3986. Congratulations going out to a couple of members of the EWTN radio family. Aperio Radio in Sheridan, Wyoming is celebrating their eighth year as an EWTN affiliate. And Totus Tuus Catholic Radio in Gainesville, Georgia marks six years with EWTN. Congratulations to Greg Marshall at Aperio Radio and Carol Bush and Mark Peffer at Totus Tuus from all of your friends here at EWTN 
Radio, 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. And if you'd like to send us an email, we'd be happy to uh, correspond with you via that means. Just send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. That's open line, all one word, at EWTN.com. It's EWTN's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. You need to pray. There's two things I want you to do. Keep close to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. He's really and truly present. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Stay close to his mother. With those two loves, you will always have the light to see what is right and what is wrong. This is Michael McCall, producer of EWTN Open Line. Have a safe and blessed new year from all of us at EWTN Radio. Family, in gratitude for the life and service of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, let us together pray for the blessed repose of his soul. O God, faithful rewarder of souls, grant that your departed servant, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, whom you made successor of Peter and shepherd of your church, may happily enjoy forever in your presence in heaven the mysteries of your grace and compassion, which he faithfully ministered on earth. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. This is EWTN Catholic Radio. Tomorrow on More to Life, why can't I be like that? Are you getting caught in the comparison game? We'll help you break free. That's tomorrow on More to Life. Now back to Open Line with Father Brian Milady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Kevin. He's a first-time caller in Kansas City, Missouri, listening on Catholic Radio Network. Kevin, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Uh, thank you. Hey, Father, uh, does a soul, a person gain merit if they're persecuted and they don't know it? Like, say, take, for example... Your boss at work that never promote you and treat you kind of badly, and you take it such, but you do not know the real reasons though for it. Uh, you, you do know you're persecuted, though, right? No, no, that you do not know. Oh well, why would you know that? Uh, I'm a little confused again. Um, well, no. Let's say, let's say your boss. No, let's say that somebody was knew that you were Catholic and hated Catholics, and then would deny you promotions and such because of that. But he, but he would, you would not ever know that. But you didn't know the real reason. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you gain uh, merit for many suffering that you do for any particular reason. Um, I think it would help matters to make you more uh, open to the receiving of the suffering to know why it's done. But most many people never know the reason. You know, you often ask people the reason and they lie to you. They won't tell you what the real reason is. So you have, just have to kind of go in faith that I'm doing the best I can if they don't see it that way, well, there must be some reason, but I'm not aware of what it is. But I would say to answer the basic question, that if you 
realize that it's a matter of discrimination or something like that for whatever reason and you still continue to do a good job and you still continue to demonstrate that you're properly disposed regarding your uh, work and that sort of thing that it's meritorious for you does that help kevin yeah, yeah, but you know, it's just if you never knew it though, and you still continued, you know, doing your job, thinking, well, maybe I'm just stupid or something, and uh, suffering, you know, suffering, it wouldn't be like. Well, that would be told by the results. I mean, if you're succeeding, and you're doing a good job, that's that's obvious. But you, There's yeah, but you know, it wouldn't problem. be like you know, it wouldn't be like externally, you know, where you're actually getting drugged, you know, getting thrashed or something. No, you know, like old, no, yeah. no. But it could be due to prejudice against you and things like that. Um, I, I always have difficulty with theoretical problems. <laughs> I like people to tell me something that really happened. Yeah. Because you can think of anything in theoretical problems that probably some of which may never happen to anybody. Unfortunately, so. I think all too often in those situations... People know darn well what's going on. Right. I know that uh, my wife Johnette's father uh, worked when she was younger, uh, when she was a young girl at, at a, a prominent uh, corporation in the United States that was known to have a Masonic hierarchy within that corporation. And he, mm. he reached a certain level and was called in and basically told that he will go no further because he's Catholic. Yeah. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next, we hear from Lorraine. She is in Melbourne, Florida, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Lorraine, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Thank you. Hello, Father. Hi. Uh, hi. I had a, uh, a follow-up question on um, cremation and ashes. Um, when my sister passed away, she was cremated, <clears throat> and um, her husband thought he was doing a nice thing by uh, getting some of us a necklace with her ashes in it. So what I want to know is, should I take my necklace and take it to her grave and sprinkle the ashes on her grave so that it's back with I mean, hers is buried under the ground, but should I just sprinkle the ashes maybe on the grass on top of her grave? I think I told you that sprinkling is considered to be very disrespectful. You can just bury it there, not sprinkle it. So you would just take the piece of jewelry and bury and the whole piece bury of jewelry? Bury the whole thing, right. Does that make sense to you, Lorraine? Yes, yes, thank you. I, I just felt bad when I heard that. And I, I know my sister loved God so much, and she was, you know, we just, he didn't know, so, and I really didn't Most know. Most people either. don't, but that's why we have to tell people not to do it. God if bless everybody, you, Lorraine. If everybody knew already, we wouldn't have to tell them. So. <laughs> that's right. God bless you, Lorraine. Thanks so much for the phone call. You've helped a lot of folks out there today by asking that question. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Connor is in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, listening on Catholic Radio in South Carolina. Connor, you're on with Father Milady. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to ask, um, why did Jesus wither away the olive branch? Why did, olive tree. Yeah, why did Jesus curse the olive tree and it withered away, Father? Oh, because it wasn't bearing fruit. And he and it's a symbol of how we must bear fruit. And you remember that um, in the particular gospel passage, the vine dresser asks the owner to please allow it still to grow for a year, and he will take care of it and see if he can bear fruit from it. So the idea is that there are many in the human race who don't initially bear fruit from the truth as preached in the gospel. But if Jesus, uh, who is merciful, intercedes for them, it's because he wants to be the vine dresser. 
and to take care of the plant, and hopefully he can bring something forth from it. Thank you, Connor. We appreciate the question today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Plenty of time for your phone calls and open lines available for you right now at 833-288-3986. It's Thursday. That means the world over tonight with Raymond Arroyo, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Join Raymond and his guests as they discuss the topics of the day from a Catholic perspective. That's the world over with Raymond Arroyo tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern time on EWTN television and radio. Wide open phone lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Jerome writes in, I know Christ was fully man and fully God, but after he was resurrected, did he lose his humanity? Well, he didn't lose his humanity because it's this human body that is resurrected. So he can hardly lose it and have it too at the same time. No, he uh, retained his humanity. In fact, the hypostatic union exists for all eternity once, it's, once it happens in Mary's womb. It's a permanent relationship. It's not uh, temporary, so it can be lost. So he did not lose his humanity, but he shows to us, finally speaking, what humanity means in its perfection. And not only that, but the judgment is pronounced from his human lips um, uh, the end of the world. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, here, here's, here's, here's one I've never heard before, Father. <laughs> Ellen has been given some bad information, if you could set the record straight here. She said, a priest told me after three times of confessing a mortal sin, there can be no absolution. Is this true? Can you only be forgiven three times? Well, uh, let, me, let me just say this. Uh, regarding your religion, I would highly recommend that you read the Catechism yourself because it's not hard to understand. And certainly that is not true. The Catechism is very much against this. Any time that you commit a mortal sin and you're sorry for it, remember you have to have confession, contrition and absolution. Anytime you do that, God forgives your sin. How, it's like, how often must I love my brother? Seven times? No, I say you 70 times, seven times. Christ's mercy is always there to give to you. I, I don't quite understand that a Catholic shouldn't ask that question because it's something we teach everybody from the time they're children. But uh, if you're interested in any kind of question ever like that, I don't care if a priest told you that. You, you can look it up yourself. It's in the catechism. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Jim says, I am not a Catholic. Where does the authority for priests to administer the sacraments come from? The authority for priests to administer the sacraments comes directly from Christ because he himself has a physical body he acts in his humanity, divinity, uh, from his divine person through his physical body. And he communicates the ability to do that in several parts of the scripture. One is, of course, the famous Keys episode, which has to do with the jurisdiction of the church and the papacy over the bishops. Then, of course, you have the upper room after he rises in the dead, where he breathes on them with his physical body. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And he says, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are shall be retained. Because Christ's human nature, his human intellect, his human will, his human passions, and his human body are absolutely necessary for the mission of the Holy Trinity in the person of the Holy Spirit sanctifying us will become present to us. So that's where it says in the Bible. 
Thanks, Jim. We and appreciate course, it. You, go ahead. And of course, in, in the Eucharist, you have to do this in remembrance of me in the Last Supper. No. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Still time for your phone calls at 833 833- Two eight eight three nine eight six. Um, Alan says, "I know Jesus taught us not to fear and to trust. So, how could the agony in the garden have happened?" It's an interesting question. Um, well, uh, he means don't be afraid in the extent that you become hopeless. The, the, obviously, anytime you're presented with a possible evil, either a physical evil or a spiritual evil, the proper reaction is fear. And so, uh, and courage, too, both together. It's normal and natural. So in the garden, Christ knows what his passion is going to entail. He also knows that God wills this for the sake of the salvation of the human race. He also knows that this is going to be resolved by the resurrection. Still, the fact that it's going to hurt so much. And remember, Jesus' body was perfectly constituted. So if a body is perfectly constituted, that means physically it has more sensitivity than if it's not perfectly constituted. And so physically, Christ feels more pain at being struck or cut than we do. He knows all these things. He knows they're going to be the result of sin. By tradition, we are taught, especially by Pius Pope, uh, Pius the Eleventh, uh, that Christ in the garden experienced the effects of human sin and it's a frontery to God for the whole human of the, of the human history, which includes us now, people in the past, people in the future, and that caused him such revulsion of, of fear and uh, possibly future pain that he sweat blood in his physical body. So it's precisely because Christ could suffer these things. And because the passion is related to the forgiveness of sins, that Jesus does embrace them. But he doesn't embrace them because they hurt. In fact, from, uh, from the point of view of the perception of the future pain, he finds them repulsive. That's why he says, if it's possible, if this cup pass me by. But he also knows in his higher self that it's his only way to redeem the human race. And so he embraces it from that perspective. And that's why he says, but not my will, but yours be done, which is where our moral faculties reside in our higher will. Our toll-free number is 833-288-EWTN. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. Uh, Paula says that she heard a Protestant preacher say that Paul was a prophet for the Gentiles while Peter was a prophet for the Jews. Is this true? And if so, why were their messages different? Uh, well, that's not just a Protestant thing. That's, in fact, what makes Peter that's different just a, from That's Paul. just a thing. <laughs> it's, it's a fact, actually, in the Scripture. Uh, Peter's apostolate is for apostolate. Now, notice I didn't say prophecy. His apostolate is for the Jews, and Paul's apostolate is for the Gentiles. I believe Paul himself says this in the Acts of the Apostles. So um, their message is different, but because they're dealing with different groups with different ways of expressing things, it's often couched in different terminology. It's the same reason, for example, that we have the same events accounted in Jesus' infant birth by uh, Luke and Matthew, but they're obviously from a different perspective. Matthew's case, it's for the Jews. It's for the mission to the Jews. And the Jews did not accept the testimony of women. So Matthew is spoken from the point of view of Joseph. On the other hand, Luke, who was a companion of Paul, if you remember, 
And he was writing his gospel for the Gentiles. And the Gentiles did accept the testimony of women. So the perspective that's portrayed there is Mary's. Both are complementary. Both go together. They don't contradict each other at all. And, but they emphasize different parts of the mystery. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. We can still get you on the air at 833-288-3986. All right, Father, since you like hypotheticals so much, um, Salvatore wants to know, if someone passes away unexpectedly, for instance in a tragic car accident, and possibly not in a state of grace, are they given different salvation consideration? Look, if they're not in a state of grace, they're not in a state of grace. That's the objectivity. So, no, they're not. That's why we pray for a happy death and we pray that we'll be aware from every day to prepare ourselves for our own death in case something unexpected does happen. Um, St. Joseph is the person to invoke for this because he died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. And so what better way for us to experience death than in that way? But uh, we, we don't like people going to death unprepared. And that's why it's necessary for us to encourage people while they're on earth and while they're alive and kicking and while they're functioning and while they're thinking and willing and all those things, not to wait till the last minute of your life. Unfortunately, as you know, there's a part of the last of the sacraments, which we call now the sacrament of the sick, but used to be called the last anointing, extra unction, that we now have people wait until the last instant of their life to call the priest. We were just uh, reflecting on this the other day in the parish here, and we said, it's so weird today, Catholics don't re seem to realize but they don't have to wait till the, the person's in the state of death to finally call the priest. And we have to drop everything and rush over there, you know, for maybe it's a half an hour away by car. And because they don't seem to realize you could prepare yourself beforehand now, too. And you should. If you, you should every day be aware that this might be your last day on earth. And reflect on it in that way and prepare for your death in that way, too. In, in the priest's office, which some of the lay people will say now, too, you have the famous Canticle of Simeon, which occurs in Compline at the end of the day. And now you let your servant go in peace, which is a prayer for death. My, your word has been fulfilled, says Simeon, because my eyes have seen your salvation in the tiny child. Remember, they waited all their lives in the temple and a lot of rights were revealed to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. So here you have people who are prepared as soon as they see the Messiah. They want to experience death because they think their life has been fulfilled then. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Michael, a first-time caller in Omaha, Nebraska, listening on Spirit Catholic Radio. Michael, you're on with Father Milady. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Surely. Hi, I, hey, I've got a family member that is a Protestant, and uh, he doesn't believe in purgatory due to uh, Christ, uh, offering the thief uh, paradise on the same day. And uh, I was wondering how I could go about refuting that or... Uh, well, first of, all, first of all, not everybody experiences purgatory after their death. So in the case of the good thief, he recognized his punishment was for his crime. So in that sense, he, un he offered his punishment for his crime and he underwent his purgatory on earth. But for those who don't go through their purgatory on earth, even though they die in the state of grace, the question is, do they get away with it? And does somebody have to atone for those things they did wrong, like if they killed people or stole from people or were generally violent people? 
manipulative, destructive, you go down the list, jealous, angry, love them to uh, commit detraction and those kinds of things. Somebody has to make up for that. Now, if they haven't done it on earth through their own sufferings, then they have to embrace it after they die. The difference is that on earth you can make positive actions to atone for this. In other words, the temporal punishment to your sin, not the eternal punishment. After death, there's no more positive moral growth. So you're left to do this only passively, which can be a, quite a process. So that's why we have people on earth that offer positive acts to help these people, like indulgences and that kind of thing, in order so they can resolve their process more quickly because of the common concern and consideration of the Christian community for each other. And it's, this is especially true in our Lord. So, in a sense, there's a point where there, the person has a, a point uh, that is, if you, if you don't make your purgatory on earth, you have to do it in heaven, after death, before you go to heaven. But a person who... Uh, does make up for their sin while they're here on earth. Um, and you can see this in people like Ezekiel, uh, Zacchaeus. You know, if I defrauded anyone, I repay them four times over, those kinds of things. If you do that while you're on earth, you won't have a purgatory afterwards. If you don't, then you will. So it's a passive purgation. Uh, which result from positive actions which you did that were inhuman while you were here on earth. Very quickly, we'll head to Bruce, another first-time caller in Bay City, Michigan, listening on the EWTN app. Bruce, just a couple minutes left with Father Milady. What's your question today? Yeah, I was just telling him, I, I've been a Catholic about six years, and I, I try to go to confession, actually, every Saturday, and my, the thing is that bothers me. Some people say, oh, you don't have to go like that. But my problem is I repeat the same thing. <laughs> like, I us say uh, gossip. I mean, you try to keep quiet and all this stuff. All, so that, to me, you know, you read it, uh, they say that's a, a sin. So you got to go back, do the same. <laughs> so what but, about some advice for repeat offenders, so to speak, Father? We re well, the first same of, things. Well, first of all, um, it's really malicious gossip that's sinful. Uh, just sharing family news would be considered to be that. But I w what I will say to you is that it's like saying, well, I don't have to go to the doctor even if I have terminal cancer uh, when he tells me to every month because it's the same disease. So wh why can't he just cure me once? Well, we're not that way physically, and we're even less that way morally. We need to constantly to express where we need healing. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? May all blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Mullady, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Gubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to Open Line Friday. Back at it tomorrow with our very own Vice President of Theology, Colin Donovan on Open Line Friday. Until then... God bless.